The reading this morning is John chapter 8, commencing at the 31st verse, and can be found on page 1074 of the New Testament section of the Bible. That's page 1074. John 8, verse 31. who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We're not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. We live in an age when truth is under attack from all sides. Disinformation and its close neighbour misinformation are terms in regular use in the broadcast media. The recent riots have shown again that disinformation on social media has been a very powerful tool in stirring up dissent and hatred. That this has had very serious consequences, resulting in injury and even death and many lives have been wrecked as a consequence, not least among the perpetrators of trouble. We need to recognise that disinformation is a euphemism or another word for lying. The very clear intention is to mislead and at the very least distort the truth so people will be widely influenced to rally to a cause or to take action in a way that the originators uh, of the content design. This is so much part of our work today. So it's significant that the BBC have found the need to establish a unit in the last two years or so called BBC Verify to counter the pernicious impact of so much lying on social media. Arguably, what is even more deadly and sinister there is deliberate action by governments and multinational organisations and companies to manipulate and distort the truth for their own ends. Wasn't it alarming to see this happening in the United States on a grand scale as the 2020 presidential election result was challenged and mobs ended up storming the Capitol building in Washington? Two, the word spin has come into common usage in recent years. And that means a selective presentation of facts, or even arguably a distortion of the truth, to further a, protect, a particular contention or argument. This is now regarded as normal behaviour by many, by not all politicians, but some, and a whole profession of media specialists employed by government companies and others to put out their message in the most pleasing and acceptable way. This profession are now widely known as spin doctors. 
These are not lies, but they do represent an unbalanced presentation of reality very often, intended to portray their paymasters in the best possible light. You may not be surprised to discover that these distortions are not exactly new. Indeed, the writer to the Ecclesiastes says there is nothing new under the sun. I was reminded of Jesus' exchange with the Roman governor Pilate. He was brought before Pilate after a show trial before the Jewish Sanhedrin, of which many lies were told and false witnesses put forward. At one point in their encounter, when Jesus felt pressed into a response, he said, Everyone who is on the side of truth listens to me. Everyone who is on the side of truth listens to me. Pilate's rhetorical question or answer has gone down in history. What is truth? This has so often been the response of the world-weary politician or leader who has seen it all, of the cynic, of the sceptic or the philosopher. How can I know, how can we know where the truth really lies? When so many come to make their place claiming to represent the truth, the ultimate reality, their account of why the world is as it is and what should be done about it. But, in the midst of all this, we have one of the clearest statements that Jesus ever made. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This was not a message that Pilate or any of the Jewish leaders would have been willing to hear. Indeed, it would have been regarded by the Jews as further evidence demanding Jesus' death. These words were of course spoken in the intimate company of his disciples the evening before his death, their last supper together which we've commemorated this morning. The conversation in which our text occurs probably took place a few months beforehand after Jesus had gone to Jerusalem for one of the feast days and was teaching in the temple. That's the background to our reading this morning. It was in a semi-public setting and these words were addressed to people who were attracted by Jesus' message and John says believed in him. However, they still had many questions and doubts. So, Jesus says to the Jews who have believed him, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus is in effect saying, if you follow, if you believe in my words and my teaching, you will be able to know the truth. If you come to that position, to that commitment to me, you can really be free. As proud Jews, this was too much to take for them to take on board. They were extremely proud of their history and heritage as children of Abraham, the founding father of the nation. They had seen many ups and downs in their history, and they were currently experiencing a major down, occupation by the Romans, which they bitterly resented and challenged in every way they could. However, Jesus made it clear he was not suggesting that they should be slaves to the Roman occupiers, but he did say that they were slaves to sin. Again, he says, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son, the son of God, sets you free, you will be free indeed. What a promise that is. In making this bold statement, Jesus uses a phrase which comes over again and again in the Gospels, and particularly in John. Very truly I tell you, or as the authorised version had it, which some of us grew up with, verily, verily, I say to you, the Sermon on the Mount and other key sayings, by using this introduction, Jesus is underlining the claim that he made to his disciples. My whole nature is truth. Truth that is the essence of what my Father God represents and stands for. 
Now I want to explore three aspects of that truth this morning. The first aspect of that is acknowledging that Jesus is the truth. As we've already reiterated, Jane, Jesus claimed in that famous saying, I am the way, the truth and the life, to be the embodiment of truth. Jesus has entered our world as God incarnate, God in human form, showing us what God is like, and ultimately dying on our behalf to reconcile us to God. So if you want to know what God is like, then look at Jesus. Colossians says, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. What a claim that is. And again, in the prologue to John's Gospel, very familiar words. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the fundamental truth about Jesus and God, his Father. In him, all things hold together. So when we come to the big questions of life, so the ultimate question is about why we are here, what is the purpose in life, what happens when we die, and so many more. Our starting point is and must be Jesus, and what he shows us about life and death, and about God his Father. Our source of information and authority is what the Bible teaches about the life and death of Jesus, and its significance, and about the nature and character of God. So if you want to know the truth and encourage others who may be seeking and tempted to try other pathways, then encourage them to read the Bible for themselves, perhaps starting with John or Mark's Gospel. There are so many plans for living, self-help philosophies, techniques to achieve a better life out there. The devil is still active in trying to snare people into anything that avoids looking at Jesus. Anyone who is serious about ultimate truth, or even doubts that there can be ultimate truth, should look at Jesus. Read scripture for themselves, and perhaps a simple introduction or online account. But Jesus not only helps us to understand the truth about God, he also helps us to see and accept the truth about ourselves. So, Acknowledging the truth about ourselves. I think that very few of us are readily able to accept other people's insights into our faults and flaws, uh, particularly if these people have or had some authority over us. I guess this may apply to school or college reports or assessments we may have. Test results, of course, may speak for themselves but we readily challenge opinions, as we would refer to them, about our behaviour and attitudes. We may come to back to these later, however, and acknowledge that our teacher or tutor may have been nearer to the truth than we were prepared to admit or acknowledge at the time. In the same, in the same way, uh, we may have kicked back against appraisals or reviews that we've had at work, feeling that they were unfair or biased against us. Perhaps the most uncomfortable position of all uh, we have is in accepting concern or feedback from those who we know love us and have our best interests at heart, our other half, our parents earlier in life, and even, dare I say, our adult children. Many of us are stubborn and find it easy to cling to the image of ourselves we have developed over the years. If we're honest with ourselves, by the time we reach mature adulthood, we are aware of our weaknesses, tendencies that we have and temptations to which we are particularly prone. However, we may be prepared to acknowledge these only to ourselves, and then in only 
rare moments of insight or reflection. Human nature is to kick back against the voice of conscience and restraint, insisting that we can please ourselves, we are strong enough to live with this, and we remain in control of our own destiny. I've observed before that one of the most popular funeral songs uh, listed in, in feedback or, or, or polls is I Did It My Way. Many of us would shy away from Jesus' words that anyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. If we are all sinners, as the Bible tells us, that means that each of us is in some way a slave to sin until we have acknowledged and repented of those sins, accepting the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf, as we've remembered this morning, and committed ourselves fully to love and serve Jesus. The Old Testament shows us that God is a God of truth, and one who re requires truthfulness from all who would worship him. The psalmist says this, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart. Part of that is acknowledging the truth about ourselves and our own weaknesses and shortcomings. The Bible says God is not a man that he should lie. So in relation to many false prophets who lied or bent the truth to suit their own purposes or to speak what they felt the king or leaders wanted them to say. But Jesus said by way of sharp contrast that the devil is the father of lies. His mission is constantly to undermine truth, to twist, to spin, to fabricate. Even in the Garden of Eden, do you remember, his opening line, uh, uh, to Eve when she was faced with temptation was, did God say? That suggestion from the evil one has been at the heart of temptation ever since, especially for those who have some understanding or fear of God. So often we may succumb over and over again to the same temptations and lies of the devil. We may talk about our weaknesses, or as some jokingly refer to as their besetting sins. There needs to be that point when we come to Jesus as Saviour for the first time, to acknowledge the truth about ourselves, that we are a sinner, that we cannot live the way God wants us to live in our own strength, and seek his forgiveness and cleansing through his sacrifice on the cross for us. However, you perhaps came to that commitment to Christ possibly many years ago, but find that you still struggle with particular temptations or weaknesses. Please be assured that this is a common experience. Some may experience that taking Christ at his word, that if he makes us free, then we will be free indeed. And we know of those who've known deliverance by the power of the Holy Spirit from addictions, drugs, alcohol, smoking, ingrained patterns of behaviour and experience a glorious release. Even then discipline may be needed to keep clear of areas of temptation. For others the struggle may continue. Even the Apostle Paul was in despair about his weaknesses and the strength of his sinful nature. And what a giant he was. He says, O sinful man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? And his response to his own question is, Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Temptations are common to us all and will continue until the day we pass on. But we have that promise that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness even if we come back time and again and express genuine sorrow and regret. The key is being truthful and remorseful about ourselves before God, and if we have hurt or damaged someone else, to seek their forgiveness too. We do not need to live under the burden of, of temptation or the burden of sin. Christ has set us free, and we can know that freedom through confession of sin.
There's a glorious liberty in being confident that our sins are forgiven, the slate is wiped clean, and that we are children of God forever. Thirdly and lastly, we need to allow truth to permeate every area of our lives. For those who have sought and experienced the freedom that Jesus offers, the call of Scripture is that we should be men and women of the truth, and that we should allow truth to permeate every area of our lives. Let's look at uh, Psalm 15 again, which we did earlier. Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart. I believe the Lord looks for truthfulness and integrity in every area of our lives, in our dealings with others, in our relationships in the family, among our colleagues, friends and neighbours, and in the church. Indeed, we as Christians should have the reputation of being trustworthy, completely honest and above board in all our doings, in all our dealings, and in so doing, we will and should stand out from much of the prevailing culture around us. We hardly need telling that dishonesty and lying are widespread in our society. For instance, there is an epidemic of shoplifting we hear, not just from those suffering from addiction and desperate for money, but from people who take higher value items or forget to include a few items when they go through a self-checkout. There is a culture around that large shops and organisations can afford it, or they should employ more cashiers, so it's okay to cheat and steal in these circumstances. The same applies when filling out a tax return, or claiming benefits and other allowances. People justify themselves by saying a little honesty, dishonesty is okay, if I'm not hurting or stealing from a specific individual. In the workplace, we should be known as people of honesty and integrity, who are honest about our mistakes and shortcomings, who actually put in the hours when we are working from home, and are known to be those who don't gossip or run people down when they're not around. We should seek to be truthful too in our relationships. I believe that does not always mean being fully candid, where that would not help a person concerned. But our intention, our guideline, I suggest should always be that we don't want to mislead somebody else. Our love and concern for people will always guide us. If we've made a mistake, we should own up, rather than try to cover up to avoid a row or worry about our reputation. In the church, Paul says we should speak the truth in love. We should never lie or seek to mislead one another. We should perhaps ask ourselves before we speak or post anything online, are we really speaking the truth or just sharing an opinion or judgment? In our fellowship life together, we need to practice openness and transparency whilst respecting confidentiality and the feelings of others. And this isn't always easy as we know. So seeking to sum up, it seems to me that Scripture is saying that truthfulness about ourselves, integrity and truthfulness in our relationships is honouring to God. This means that we don't distance ourselves from God and the joy of His presence by sin or disobedience. Above all, being in the truth, rejoicing in the truth, brings freedom and wholeness to every area of our lives. If Jesus truly is at the centre of every area, of our lives personally and our inner corporate life together, then we will know the truth, set us free. Lack of honesty and lying just brings problems, complications, and breeds lack of trust, leading to strained and broken relationships, as we know from situations we're aware of and from countless films and TV dramas. As Christians, with Jesus at the centre, the essence of truth, we have been shown a different way, and we have the Holy Spirit in our hearts to help us live in true freedom. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you indeed that you are the way, the truth, and the life. 
Father, we want to live in the truth. We want to live in freedom. Lord, we pray that we would open our lives, Lord, transparently before you, that we would allow your Holy Spirit to touch our hearts uh, in areas where we need to hear your words and to hear your voice. But Lord, we pray indeed that we might do business with you if we need to, whether it's coming to you for the first time or, or renewing our desire and, 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 and our commitment to walk in truthfulness before you. Father, speak to us and help us, we pray. Thank you for your promises. Thank you that if we trust in you, we really are children of God, sons of God. And in that sonship lies perfect freedom. Amen. Amen.